So far we've had the broad introduction to this method uh, called epistolary analysis or a letter structure approach or form criticism of letters. And I've given you a thesis. It was uh, encapsulated nicely in one of those quotes earlier, but in my own words it would be that Paul is a skilled letter writer and thereby able to either change or adapt the conventions of his letter so that they more persuasively uh, make the point he's uh, trying to say and, and that these things are better connected to the heart of what the letter is all about. So now I need to, so to say, take out this theory on a test drive and uh, not only illustrate for you what it would look like, but hopefully along the way prove to you that this is indeed a true thing, a viable way of approaching the text. So we're going to start off with uh, the first part of Paul's letters because you know perhaps from your reading that Paul's letters have four parts, the opening, the thanksgiving, the body, and the closing. And we're going to start off by just looking then at the letter opening. And we're going to get even more narrow than that. We're going to, within the letter opening, focus in on three different parts. You have the sender or author unit, you have the recipient unit, and you have the opening greeting. And so let's zoom in even more closely then on the sender unit. But before we do that, what is our plan of attack? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to, so to say, determine what Paul normally does. How do we do that? Well, we, we lay all of Paul's letters, so to say, side by side, and we can see then a relatively fixed pattern that emerges. And we need to know that because if we don't know what he normally does, we won't have eyes to see. We won't be able to be uh, what Ratzel called the alert reader to see when he does something unique or different. I'm going to quickly go through uh, the, what he normally does because this overlaps with uh, some of the reading that you've done. And so uh, you'll know perhaps and from those readings that the sender unit, the very, very first thing in Paul's letters, is typically his name. And you might be surprised by that because you put your name at the bottom of a letter, but uh, in the ancient world that's not the case. Uh, there is no mail service, so uh, somebody whom you probably don't know, a friend of uh, an author is going to come to you and say, here's a letter from so-and-so, or they might even read it from you, and at the very beginning they tell you who's talking to you in the letter. And so Paul, in keeping with letter writing practice of his day, has his name first. And then he has a title, and by far the most common title he uses is Apostolos, Apostle. A couple of times he has an alternate title or additional to Apostolos. He has Doulos or Servant. And then he has a short descriptive phrase giving the source of that title. And it's either Christus Iesu, of Christ Jesus, or it's the prepositional phrase, dia thelematos thau, by the will of God. Now a fourth thing that Paul has is a co-sender. And uh, this is a little unusual because most letters in Paul's day did not have a co-sender, though some did, so it's not never heard of, but it's a bit unusual. And this, of course, raises some interesting questions as to, like, why does Paul include a co-sender and what significance might that have? Uh, this isn't the place to have that discussion, but uh, a number of people have wondered whether or not uh, when you have two names mentioned, Paul and Timothy, or three names, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, who is the real author? Is it a kind of a group project where they all sit around the table and, and, and you know, Timothy says something and Paul says, yeah, good point, you know, let's do that. And then Silas says something. In other words, it truly is a group effort. Or is Paul the ultimate author and he includes co for another reason? Uh, that actually, I think, is the stronger uh, answer. And some of the notes here give you some uh, proposed reasons why Paul would include uh, a co -sender. But we're not going to get bogged down with those details now. What I, what I want you to say, see is, is that if you had to write the lost letter of Paul to, say, the Laodiceans, you say, what are you talking about? Lost letter of Paul to the Laodiceans. Well, Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans that we don't have. How do I know that? Well, when Paul wrote to the Colossians, he says, see to it that you read the letter I wrote to the Laodiceans, and they read the letter I wrote to you. It's kind of a letter swap. And so I know that Paul wrote at least one, and I know he wrote more letters that we don't have anymore. And if your homework assignment was to uh, recreate right what that opening lost letter would look like actually that'd be an easy assignment for you to fulfill you would say I know how that's gonna go you would say I know it starts off with this name it would be Paul you say next it'll have a title and uh, probably be apostle 
And then you're going to give uh, the source of that status that Paul has. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Maybe you might add, by the will of God. And, and then if you had to pick somebody to be with him, you might say, well, uh, Laodicea, he wrote that at the same time of Colossians when he was under house arrest in Rome. And Timothy was with him, and so I guess I'll pick Timothy as a co-sender. Or uh, let me say it this way. If you had to say or recite a typical letter opening to Paul, in one breath, it would be pretty easy. It would go like this. You would say, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now, I stress that because notice how different than Romans will or ought to feel to you. Try that in one breath. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised before him through his, script, for his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel according to his Son, who descended from David according to the flesh, and designated the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we receive grace and apostle, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. <gasps> oh. oh, any any difference about that opening? Well, obviously, the first one that well, see, now you're an alert reader. Maybe all the rest of your life when you read Romans, you weren't. It went right over your head. But now it seems pretty clear, yeah, this one is different, first and foremost, by the fact that it's, it's way longer than any of Paul's other letter openings. But there are other unique features, too. I noticed that there's, only, uh, that there's no mention of a co-sender in the opening of Romans. And that's interesting, since I know that Timothy was with him. How do I know that? Because at the end of the letter, in the greetings, Paul passes on the greetings of Timothy to the Romans. So, so in other places, Paul always includes Timothy as a co-sender. Why not here in the letter to Romans? I observe that there is not one, but three titles. There is also a description of the gospel in verse 2, which is of interest. And then there's something, we'll explain that in just a moment, that most scholars call traditional or confessional material in verses 3 and 4. And then there's some other stuff there in 5 and 6. And so now the question I want you to consider is, what about all these unique features, all these things, these ways in which Romans is unique or different than Paul's other letters? And you have to ask yourself now, is this by accident or fluke chance? Did Paul just get kind of filled with the Spirit and went crazy, went a lot longer? I mean, the rest of Romans is pretty long compared to his other letters. Maybe the opening should be longer too. Or is it uh, something that Paul has consciously done? It's deliberate, and therefore, it is potentially exegetically significant. By the way, a little suggestion. Always pick option two when I give you this question. Now, first of all, um, well, uh, we might want to correct the fact that Paul went crazy and went a little long. Because uh, if uh, I read Romans carefully, uh, well, let me say it this way. Romans 16, all those greetings at the end, well, then suddenly, boom, this person sticks his head of the text and says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. And you say, who's this Tertius guy? I thought Paul was talking to me. Well, Paul is indeed the author of the letter, but Tertius is his secretary. The technical term is amanuensis. And so already you can see we need to nuance our understanding of the letter in light of letter writing practices in that day. It was quite common to use a secretary in the writing of a letter, and Paul did in the writing of Romans, and he did in five other letters too, and probably some others as well. But we'll talk about that maybe when we get to the letter closing. Now let's go back to, op to, to the opening of Romans and say, now, what about all these unique features? You know, what's with that? And what you need to understand, first of all, is the unique situation of uh, Paul vis-a-vis -vis the, I'll put these back up again, uh, these unique features, uh, Paul vis-a-vis -vis the Roman church. Romans is one of only two letters that Paul writes to a church that he neither founded, started, established, nor uh, to a, a church where, he, where they know him and he knows them. And I don't know if you really appreciate how different that puts Paul in, in terms of position to his audience. In other words, Paul is in a lot stronger position writing to a group of Christians that he brought the gospel to, that he led to Christ, a, a church that he started. I'll give you an analogy from my own life. Um, there is a pastor in my past history whom I'm especially close to, and the reason we are is because uh, even though I grew up in a Christian home, it was during a certain part of my life when I was 18 years old where I committed my life to Christ and that had a big impact on me and also my uh, sense of calling, vocation. And this pastor played a strategic role at that point in my life. And as a result, uh, 
I have a very fond and special relationship with him. Now, it's also important for you to know that he's not a particularly gifted pastor, at least, you know, from an objective point of view. Uh, he doesn't have a great track record, at least in one congregation there was a little bit of pushback, but, but that doesn't matter to me. Uh, he, he still is beloved to me. Why? Well, because during a very important part of my life, right, he played a strategic role. And maybe there's someone like that in your life too, uh, somebody who led you to Christ or somebody who walked with you during a very, uh, you know, difficult or traumatic moment. And so you have a special relationship with this person. And so if you're writing to this person or if that person is writing to you, that's a lot different than if you're writing to someone or you're getting a letter from somebody whom you don't know at all. And this is the problem Paul faces in Rome. He hasn't started the church. He hasn't led them to Christ and he's never been there. And it gets even worse than that because uh, I heard word on the street in Rome is Paul's against the law. He's dissing the prophets. He's saying things, you know, somehow against the Old Testament scriptures. And so this is what Paul admits, actually, in the letter of Romans. And so you can see that Paul is now writing to what? Uh, uh, an unknown church in some sense an unfriendly church where there is some suspicion about him, his character, his orthodoxy, and so forth. And so this explains now a lot of these unique formal features. And so let's look at them a little more closely. For instance, the length. Well, Paul needs more time at the very beginning of the letter to introduce himself, right? Somebody's talking to them whom they don't know and they're suspicious about it. Paul isn't confident that they're going to actually hear or heed him in the rest of the letter, and so he needs some extra time at the beginning to introduce himself. This would explain why he omits the name of Timothy, right? He wants the reader's attention to be focused in on him and his unique relationship to them. This would explain why he uses not just one title, but three. And it's not just the number of the titles, it's also their names. If you take a look at them for a moment, the first one is servant, in Greek, doulos, of Christ Jesus. A lot of Roman scholars see this as an allusion to the Old Testament prophets who introduced themselves, who referred to themselves as doulosses, just like Paul did, a doulos to thou, a servant of God. And now Paul introduces himself as a doulos to Iesu Christu, from the New Testament point, a servant of Christ Jesus. And there's a hint that he is standing in the tradition of the prophets, that he, like them, has an authoritative word of God that his hearers should accept. Notice the second title. He's not just an apostle, but we have the verbal idea. He's called to be an apostle. This is what we call in grammar a divine passive. That's a technical term. Don't be intimidated by it. It means that the passive voice is used, but you don't say who is the agent lying behind, and the unspoken agent is God. Well, maybe I'll just explain it for a second. I think it's an important concept that you should know about. So if I took a sentence, I could say it actively. I could say, Wyma teaches the online class. Right? The verb teaches would be active. But I could say the same thing passively. I could say, the online class was taught, right, make it passive, by Wyma. Well, the translators of the Septuagint, when they went from Hebrew to Greek, they did something quite interesting. As Jews, they didn't want to take the name of Yahweh the Lord in vain, and so where the biblical text said things like, Yahweh did something to his people, they would, first of all, turn it into a passive construction. They would say, the people were done something, and then instead of saying, by Yahweh, the Lord, they would just leave it blank. And they would assume that their readers would know that, well, of course, this was done by the Lord. And if you don't say the word, the Lord, in the text, well, then it's kind of hard to take God's name in vain. And the New Testament writers, who know the Old Testament so well, pick up on this way of speaking, this so-called divine passive, Sometimes it's called a theological passive. The idea then, the verb is in the passive, and the unspoken agent is God. Now, let's go back again to this second title, called. Now, in Pauline vocabulary and in Pauline theology, there's only one person who calls people to faith, only one person who calls people to serve in particular roles, and that's God. Now, Paul doesn't say that, but that's clearly implied. And so the question for the Roman hearers is, it's not like they get to choose whether or not Paul's their apostle. No, he has been called to be their apostle by God. And so if they don't accept him as their apostle, in a sense, they're rejecting not just Paul, but God. 
And the same thing is found then in the third term. He has been set apart for the gospel of God. That's another passive construction. Paul doesn't say who set him apart, but the unspoken agent is again God. And so this feature is quite clever and persuasive. It's not just, again, the number of the titles, but it's the names given uh, that Paul chooses to identify and introduce himself with. This might explain, then, his description of the gospel. If I ask you to define the gospel, uh, you know, I imagine it would differ from all kinds of other people in our class, their definition. There are all kinds of ways to define the gospel. Notice how Paul chooses in this letter and in this situation to define the gospel. He says, that which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I hope you get what he's doing here, right? Writing to a congregation, or churches, I should more accurately say, in Rome, where a word on the street is Paul is somehow against the Old Testament scriptures. He's somehow uh, saying things that are different than what the prophet says. And so when Paul says, now, the gospel of which I am divinely appointed and set apart to be an apostle, that which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul says, my gospel is the same one found that the prophets talked about. My gospel is the same one found in the Old Testament Scriptures. In other words, I'm not bringing you, you know, some new fangled religion. I'm bringing you the old time gospel. You know, the same one that the, that the prophets proclaimed, the same one recorded in the Scriptures. This is a pretty powerful way of we're winning over a skeptical audience in Rome. This also makes sense of why Paul uses traditional or what many scholars call confessional material. And this is the idea that uh, because of the unique vocabulary found in these verses, it's a clue that Paul isn't using his own words, but he's borrowing, he's quoting. And I hope it's clear to you that uh, this is a good thing for pastors uh, to do. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you an example of how uh, in a sermon it might be good to quote something, right? Um, uh, well, let me give you an example, a different one. Let's imagine I'm going to a church, uh, and uh, I know that this is a pretty conservative church, and they're a little suspicious about maybe someone like me, you know, some egghead from Calvin Theological Seminary. And, and so I get to the pulpit, and, and I'm thinking, boy, you know, these people are looking at me a little skeptical. The very first things I might say is something like this. I greet you this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom I belong, body and soul, and life and in death. Now, oh, I don't have to tell him, you know, that I just, that, that wasn't me speaking, that was me quoting the Heidelberg Catechism. But I hope you see what I was trying to do. I, I'm imagining these people in the pew saying, wow, you know, a Calvin seminary professor knows the Heidelberg Catechism, even is willing to quote it in church. You know, maybe it's not so bad after all. You see how it might function in terms of winning over an audience. Or here's a different kind of example with a slightly maybe different function. Let's imagine I have a sermon on spiritual warfare. I'm preaching on Ephesians 6, and the text says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And so I'm, I'm talking about this to my audience, talking about how Satan is more powerful than we are and more clever than we are, and we can't rely on our own strength and power and our own talents. We have to have our, 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 our trust rooted in, in Christ, who is our Lord and King. And then I might suddenly say in the sermon, For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. I'm not equal. You're not equal to the craft and power of our enemy, Satan. And so put your trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I hope you saw what I did. I don't have to tell the audience, oh, that wasn't me talking a minute ago. That was a him. Right? No, they, I'm assuming they know that. And in two ways, it becomes rhetorically or persuasively effective. First of all, you are completing my words because you, you sung that hymn and you know those words. You're completing those words. You're saying those words in your head. And when you're saying the same words in your head or maybe even out loud that I'm saying, it's kind of hard not to agree with me. <laughs> and what's more, you recognize that these aren't just Wyma's words. These are like the words of the Christian church over the ages, right? maybe probably millions of Christians who have sung and believed these words and so now they add weight to my words and so when I say them it's harder for you to put them off or to reject them because they're words that you have sung, they're words that others have sung, they're, they're weighty words that ought to be listened to. And so in the same vein Paul 
quotes traditional or confessional material at the beginning of his letter to the Romans in a way of reassuring them of his orthodoxy, of kind of winning them over to, uh, to trust him and his leadership. Here's yet another example of a clever thing he does in the letter opening. He refers the second time to his apostleship. There's only one letter, uh, one other letter, where Paul two times refers to his apostleship, and it's significant in that one too. And what's more, notice here the antecedent of this clause. It says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Who's the antecedent of the, who's the whom? Well, if you look in English or in Greek, the antecedent is Jesus Christ. So here's another powerful claim that it's not just me. I'm not, I'm not just pretending to be an apostle. It wasn't just an idea that I came up with. No, it's Jesus Christ himself who has called me to this particular role. Um, We've talked a couple of times about how in Rome there is some suspicion about Paul, about how, uh, how orthodox he is, especially in keeping with the Old Testament scriptures. And in light of that, when he uses that phrase in the opening, the obedience of, of faith, Paul says, the purpose of my apostleship is to take people like you and to bring them into what? The obedience of faith. The very same kind of faithful, obedient life that the Torah, the Old Testament, was meant to bring God's people to do. That's the purpose of my ministry. And then maybe one more that I don't have on the slide is worth mentioning. It's like a math equation, uh, which Paul doesn't complete, but it's pretty simple to figure out. So, so Paul says, and going back to point, uh, actually to point uh, six, Paul says, um, okay, I'm an apostle, and uh, he says, I'm an apostle, earlier he says, to the Gentiles. Okay, Paul says, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. And at the very end of this phrase, right, the end of the letter opening, Paul says, oh, by the way, you Romans, you belong to that group of people, namely the Gentiles. So take point one and add it to point two, and then even though Paul doesn't say one plus two equals three, that's the obvious conclusion. So if point one is, I'm divinely appointed to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Point two is, oh, you people in Rome are Gentiles. Point three is, I must be divinely appointed apostle to you folks over there in Rome. And so all of that, all of these features lead to this conclusion. You can see I'm quoting from the article that I wrote that spells out in print a lot of this argument. Uh, we, uh, this is my conclusion. The letter opening of Romans provides important clues to the purpose of Paul in the letter as a whole. For Paul has skillfully adapted and expanded the typical form of this opening epistolary unit such that the correlate themes of gospel and apostleship are highlighted in a most effective manner. Within the space of a few short verses, Paul presents himself to his unknown readers as the divinely appointed apostle to the Gentiles who has a God-given responsibility to share with them his his gospel. Now there's some more things there that you know I'm tempted to talk about but we'll probably get to that when we get to Romans. At this point I want you to go back to the question right that I asked you earlier and that is these unique features of Romans were they by accident flew chance or were they conscious deliberate and exegetically significant and the point of this longish first illustration is to show again that Paul is a skilled letter writer and in this case, he's done a pretty amazing job at winning over a skeptical audience so that they will hear him as he preaches to them in the body of the letter. And not only that they'll hear him, but more importantly, that they'll heed him. Now, this is only one example, and uh, maybe you're a skeptic, you're not quite convinced, and that doesn't bother me. I've got tons more examples to win you over. Let's look at another one. This one you haven't looked at, and so this is new material for you, and it deals with Galatians. So if we look at the opening of Galatians, and we could do it this way, right? It starts off by saying Paul. And the question you should say to yourself now, is that something unusual, or is that uh, normal? And the answer, of course, is that's normal. That's how Paul always begins his letters. The next thing it says, an apostle. And again, is that normal or unusual? And again, it's normal. Paul typically begins with that title, an apostle. And then we read, not from men, nor through any man, but through Jesus Christ and from God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me. And then we again say, now is that unusual or is that normal? And the answer here is, that's unusual. Paul does have some kind of short descriptive phrase indicating the source of his apostleship. 
But instead of the two positive phrases he normally has, of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, he precedes them with two negative phrases. In fact, it ends up with a nice, uh, very tight chiasm. You can see it there both in English and in Greek. And notice you have not, not in the first two, and then you have a strong contrastive in Greek. Allah is the strongest adversative, a lot stronger than the softer de. And then it's followed by two positives. And notice that the prepositions follow each other, right? The first phrase is not apple, but through, and then naturally you, re re you reverse the process, but, but through, and then and implied from. Now, you have to ask yourself, okay, this is unusual. But maybe, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, or maybe not. Maybe actually this does tie into what's going on in the letter. And so we do have to ask that question. And by the way, even though we're focusing on our literary aspect in terms of our hermeneutic, you can see how the historical can't be forgotten. So just like we couldn't understand the literary or the unique epistolary features of Romans without knowing the historical context, Namely, Paul didn't found the church, didn't start the church. There were suspicions against him there. So also for Galatians, we can't understand what Paul is doing here unless we know something about its historical context. And so if I ask you what's going on in the Galatian churches, and maybe you know, and if not, we'll again uh, expand this when we get further on in the course and we deal with this letter. But you probably have heard of somebody called the Judaizers, right? Who are Judaizers? Well, these are Jews who claim to be Christians, but who nevertheless emphasize so much the law and other elements of uh, Judaism that we give them today the name Judaizers. Now at this point, I want you to know that, that these Judaizers, they come from Jerusalem and they've invaded, I'm going to say that, they've hijacked or invaded the churches of Galatia. There isn't one place called Galatia, it's a province, a region, so these are multiple churches. And so they've invaded these churches and they have not only a bad gospel, which Paul says is no gospel at all, we'll get to that later, but right now they have a bad attitude toward Paul. In fact, they're undermining especially his status as an apostle. And I want to reconstruct for you what they surely were saying to the Galatians, and I know this from uh, from looking carefully at uh, not only Paul's life in general, but especially his letter to the Galatians. So the, Galatia, the Judaizers came to the Galatian Christians and said something like this. What are you guys listening to Paul for anyway? I mean, who is Paul, right? I mean, uh, 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 I mean, is he a disciple of Jesus? I mean, is he one of the chosen few? No, no, no. And, uh, What's more, I bet you he forgot to tell you about all the damage he did. Yeah, he didn't tell you about that, right? All the people he put in jail and all the hurt and harm he did to the church in those early days. And, and, and you know, the apostles, by the way, the apostles whom we represent, we come from Jerusalem. We reflect the authentic, authoritative teachings of James and Peter and others. The apostles, what did they do with Paul? Well, first of all, they were kind to Paul. They forgave him for all of the damage he did, and they allowed him to engage in a preaching ministry, but... He's a maverick. He's a wild man. He's preaching a gospel that goes way beyond what, what, the, what the authoritative apostles proclaim. And the sad truth is this, this bad attitude they had toward Paul was taking root in the Galatian churches. So, so the Judaizers were questioning or trying to get the Christians in Galatia to, well, to dis Paul, right? To not respect his apostolic status and authority. And so what does Paul do in that context? Well, I have the question here in the slide, you know, Paul wants to assert at the very beginning that his apostleship is legit. In other words, Paul engages in what I might call a preemptive strike. So he's going to strike later on in the letter. He's going to take on this charge and establish his apostolic credentials full blown in the body of the letter. But already in the opening, he launches this preemptive strike. And so instead of saying, as he normally does, an apostle positively of Christ Jesus by the will of God, he contrasts it first negatively. He says, not from men, nor through a man. In other words, unlike what the Judaizers were saying, I didn't get my apostleship from James or Peter or any of the other so-called head boys. He calls them pillars in Jerusalem. No, I got my calling. I'm an apostle directly from the big guy himself, namely Jesus Christ. And this is a huge important point for Paul, and he asserts that right at the beginning of the letter. 
And what's more, this also explains that other unusual thing about the letter opening, the co-senders. Because instead of simply one co-sender or two co-senders, Paul makes the co-senders as broad and generic as possible. He says, all the brothers with me. Now just think about that for a minute. I mean, if you, if you take it literally, I mean, are, are you kidding, Paul? Are you saying that every single Christian by you sat down and wrote this letter with you, right? No, of course not. But what Paul is doing is he's invoking these Christians, all the Christians with him as witnesses. In other words, Everybody over here with me recognizes that I'm an apostle, not from men, nor through a man, as my Judaizers opponents say, but I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus uh, uh, from God the Father. And so you can see that Paul has skillfully, cleverly, deliberately changed the letter opening of Galatians in order that he can already begin the argument that he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was intending to say. Well, one more uh, example, and we'll try to do this quickly before we take a break, and that comes from Philemon. So it begins with Paul, and we say, is that normal or unusual? And the answer is, it's normal. We look at the next one, prisoner, and we say, is that normal or unusual? And the answer is, well, that's unusual. That's kind of striking. Now, the skeptical person in you might make a point, right? You might rightfully say, well, uh, Okay, why well, am you know, you're, you're just reading way too much into this. He wrote prisoner because, duh, he was a prisoner. But then I have a counterpoint to your point, and that is, well, Paul was a prisoner when he wrote Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, and 2 Timothy, and he doesn't use the word apostle in any of those letter openings, only here in Philemon. And so, actually, it is striking and unique. And then the question is, by accident or fluke chance, or is it deliberate and exegetically significant? Remember, I suggested you always pick option two. Well, let's look a little more carefully at this letter and how it might be significant. I'm going to skip over uh, the first answer here that somebody has given. I want you to see at this point that the word prisoner occurs not once, not twice, not three, not four, but five times in an extremely short letter. So the one we're looking at, at the opening of the letter, is Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And then the next one is in verse 9. Paul says, I am writing to you as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And then the third thing, verse 10, deals with Onesimus. That's the slave who's run away. That's what the letter is all about. Oh, I converted him while I was in prison. And then verse 13, oh, this runaway slave of yours, I wanted to keep him here with me while I'm in prison. And then finally, 23, Epaphras, oh, who, by the way, is Philemon's pastor, right? So Philemon's pastor in Colossae, the city of Colossae, meets in Philemon's house. Epaphras has traveled all the way to Paul, and Paul puts his name right at the, begin at the beginning of all these greetings and says, oh, he's my fellow prisoner. Oh, and by the way, did I tell you that I'm a prisoner? So five times within a very compact, short, carefully written letter, Paul refers to his imprisonment. And you say, now, why? Now, one answer, I'll go back over here, and I think this is partly true, but not completely so, and that is, it was chosen because of its emotive, persuasive power. In other words, um, Paul is not very subtly reminding Philemon that he's in a bad situation, right? He's, he's in a vulnerable situation. He's in a position of need, and now he's asking him of something. And a request made by somebody who is in need is harder to turn down than somebody who is not in need. All right? So I think that's part of what's going on. But I think that there's more. I think that in addition to that, there's also a second, uh, a maybe even more significant reason why Paul uses the word prisoner at the very beginning. And that's because I think it foreshadows. So the change at the beginning of the letter foreshadows the implied or implicit request in the letter. Okay, implied or implicit means that it's not stated baldly, right? It's kind of hinted at, although uh, maybe not so subtly. It depends on your point of view. So two verses are really important. I'll begin with the second one first. The farthest away one is verse 21b. At the very end of the letter, Paul says, I am confident knowing that you will do even beyond the things that I am saying. I'm struck by that. I know what Paul is saying. Right? I can just read the letter and hear what he's saying. What are these things beyond the things I am saying that Paul is talking about? And he's confident that Philemon will do. And is he talking about that thing he mentioned earlier in the letter, verse 13? Let's look at verse 13 more carefully. The text says, Whom I, and the whom is the runaway slave Onesimus, 
right, who's with Paul. Paul is under house arrest in the city of Rome during that imprisonment uh, toward the end of his life, right, whom I was wanting to keep for myself in order that on behalf of you he might serve me and my imprisonment for the gospel. So, now, some scholars would say Paul's not even that subtle here, right? What Paul is saying is, oh, I've got the runaway slave with me. I kind of wanted to keep him here with me, but, you know, I didn't want to do anything without your consent, and so da 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 Why does Paul even mention that? As if, you know, unless he wants somehow uh, Philemon to know about it and maybe do something about it, right? I mean, uh, let's imagine I come visiting uh, you in your hometown, and I say to you something like, you know, I, I was kind of hoping to save some money and stay over at your house, but, you know, I didn't want to impose on you or your family, and so I decided to get a hotel instead. Why would I tell you that? Am I somehow hinting that maybe you're going to still make this offer so it can still happen? And so I think a good case can be made that Paul is not so subtly saying in the letter, the main request is, I want you to forgive the slave, right? Paul sends him back to him. He's run away. I want you to forgive him. But the implied request is you turn around and you send him back to me. So he can continue to help me because Paul carries on his ministry even though he's on house arrest, right? Paul can't go anywhere and visit churches firsthand or preach the gospel, but he can write letters and he can send helpers. And so people like Timothy and Epaphroditus that the Philippians sent and people like now this runaway slave Onesimus are an important tool, an important help for Paul as he carries on his ministry. Well, the important part is I've given you now a third example of how Paul changed something from what he normally did. And I've suggested to you this change was not by accident or fluke chance, but was deliberate, was conscious, and is indeed connected somehow to what's going on in the rest of the letter. And that's why it's important and exegetically significant. So uh, let's stop then for a moment with these three examples and uh, we'll get some new ones from the rest of the letter opening the next time we see each other.